macromolecules, the major molecules of life. One of the things you'll find these macromolecules in all living things, they're the building blocks of all cells. They're made up of the elements carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And they come in four different types. The carbohydrates, which contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Lipids, which contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So how do you tell the difference between the two? We'll find out. Proteins, which will contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. And then the nucleic acids, which will also contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So with carbohydrates, these are the basic units of sugars. Of course, sugars provide energy and structural support in cells. Uh, fiber is a carbohydrate that prevents constipation. Foods that you can find carbohydrates in, of course, are breads, cereals, vegetables, fruits, and seeds. Um, extra glucose, when we don't use it, can be converted into something called glycogon, which is then stored in the liver. Glucose has a structural formula, it's a ring structure as you can see here, um, and it again, it is only composed of the three elements, carbon, hydrogen, and not oxygen. Whereas lipids and fats, these are the basic units, are the fatty acids. Their function is to provide energy in a long-term sense and structure which cushions the body and prevents heat loss. You will find them in such things as butter, margarine, and candy. They're made up of the fatty acid molecules that consist of two distinct regions. One region is a long hydrophobic hydrocarbon chain, and another is a hydrophilic head. Hydrophobic means that it doesn't like water. Hydrophilic means that it does like water. So you'll see these, these very long chain we have the polar head, which is the hydrophilic, liking water, and the interior here would be the hydrophobic, the fatty acid tails, they don't like water. And of course, later you'll see this kind of a configuration when we look more in detail about the cell membrane itself. Saturated fats. A saturated fat is a type of fat that contains a single carbon to carbon bond. It has lots of hydrogen. You can always tell a saturated fat because it'll be solid at room temperature. So these are primarily animal fats, such as you fats you find in beef and pork and chicken, dairy like butter. Um, this is the type of fat that we would consider bad fat um, because this kind of fat is what can lead to arterial sclerosis or the clogging of blood vessels. Um, so when you look at these, you see a lot of single bonds within the carbon-carbon chains, very few double bonds. You can see it here at this hydrophilic region, but within the hydrophobic region in palm palmitic acid, which is palm oil, um, you won't find many of these double bonds. So saturated fats are usually referred to as bad fat. Whereas unsaturated fats, you will see within the carbon to carbon bonds, double bonds, and fewer hydrogen atoms. These types of fats tend to be liquid at room temperature. Um, so we will find them in oils, such as nuts and seeds. They tend to be more commonly found in plants. Um, this is a better type of fat. Um, just remember that both saturated and unsaturated fat, large consumptions of them, if you don't burn them off, they will cause you to gain weight. So here's the structure of fats. You can see on this um, over here, this type of fat called the tristarian. Um, this has single bonds between carbon, molecule, uh, carbon atoms, whereas you start to see some doubling bonding over here in this fat here called the tri, trilineoline types of fat. That is more, this would be a uh, plant fat versus an animal fat. Um, the um, unsaturated fats, of course, are much more healthy for you. And DNA. This would go under the category of the nucleic acids. 
So when we look at DNA, it was first actually the model was developed by two gentlemen called Watson and Crick. They developed this model in 1953 and they were able to clearly outline what the structure of DNA looked like. DNA is composed of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Um, these basic units of a DNA would be called the nucleotides, which are composed of a sugar component, a phosphate group, and a nitrogen based group, um, which would be uh, cytosine, guanine, adenine, thiamine, and uro uracil, which would be an additional um, replacement, I should say, um, nucleic uh, nitrogen base found in RNA. So the two types of nucleic acids most of you should be familiar with, hopefully this is review, would be DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid, RNA, which is ribonucleic acid, whereas the function here would be DNA directs and controls all activities of cells in an organism, whereas RNA actually helps develop, um, communicate that message from DNA out to the relevant parts of the cell, such as the ribosomes where proteins will be assembled. Evolutionarily speaking, RNA seems to have probably developed first and DNA became a secondary um, development. So DNA, which is referred to as deoxyribonucleic acid, is the hereditary materials that is passed on from your parents. It's a double-stranded um, structure, contains that phosphate grooves. The sugar that it contains is called deoxyribose, hence where we get the D. And the basis would be cytosine and guanine, adenine and thymine. They actually join in this bonding pattern. And it has that classic um, double helix structure here, or a twisted ladder, if you will. Um, we will talk a lot about DNA later when we get into protein synthesis and, of course, genetics. RNA is a um, relative of DNA. So it's probably actually the precursor to DNA. Evolutionary is probably the ancestor to DNA. It is referred to as ribonucleic acid. It is a single-stranded structure. It contains the same kinds of nucleotides in the sense it has a phosphate group. It has the sugar ribose and um, the basis would be cytosine and guanine and adenine and uracil. You'll notice here uracil actually replaces thymine in the RNA molecule. So it is single-sided. It is actually a message. It's actually a copy of portions of DNA. It acts as a messenger, takes the code from DNA and delivers it elsewhere in the cell. Um, once again, these um, different um, structures of DNA and RNA we will talk in great detail about when we get into the concept of protein synthesis as well as um, genetics when we hit those units. So I'm not going to talk a lot about them, but you should be familiar with them at this point. Proteins are our fourth category of macromolecules. They contain the atoms of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. That's the commonality between all of the macromolecules. They also contain um, elements of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Sulfur is the smell you smell when protein is burning, such as hair or tissue. It has that unique sulfur smell. Their basic unit would be the amino acids, of which there are 20 different types. Um, proteins will provide energies and structure, but they also repair body tissues. Um, some of the proteins are referred to as uh, in chemical. They're not always structural. They can be chemical in nature, and they would be hormones and enzymes and neurotransmitters are all of protein-type molecules. Um, foods that you're going to find protein in, of course, most of you know this, would be the meat products, um, but you can also find them in plant products. So you'll find them in eggs and um, milk products, nuts, beans, peas, and lentils, so all of those types of of uh, vegetable products are not only high in um, complex carbs, fiber, but they're also very high in protein. Soy, soybeans, for example, very high in protein. Um, proteins have shapes, and it's actually the shape of protein that's more important than just what makes up a protein. So we can see proteins can form what we call a primary structure. Um, this is just a very basic shape. 
and a secondary structure where the hydrogen bonds interact and they cause the protein to bend or curl, as in the case of the helix. Um, these, the shape of the protein actually, as we'll learn later, um, in the, when we talk about protein synthesis, determines more of the function of the protein than just what makes up the protein in terms of the order of amino acids, etc. So uh, additional types of shapes you can see here, you'll have tertiary structure shapes. Um, here they, they start to kind of fold in on themselves until you get to the quaternary structure, which will um, really have quite a globular folding pattern, I guess you could call it. One of the biggest examples would be the hemoglobin. They have that globin um, um, fold. And of course, hemoglobin is primarily used in our body in the red blood cells because it binds so well with oxygen. It can act as an oxygen transport as well as a carbon dioxide transport agent. So protein structures, again, you can have this, the straight primary, then they start to fold, and they can form some very complex folding patterns. And again, the folding will happen in different soil organelles. Uh, the Golgi complex is where a lot of proteins are folded, and it's that folding pattern that we seem to um, see with proteins in terms of what gives them their actual function as to what they do. And it's also where we can find some genetic abnormalities occurring. When we say that um, we have a, a mutation in a gene sequence, the mutation a lot of times can cause the protein to fold incorrectly, which means that it won't function as it should, and then you can get some genetic disorders. So again, we'll talk a lot about proteins in terms of how um, they um, affect us um, in terms of protein synthesis um, and also genetic abnormalities when we get to the genetics unit. One important type of protein and one which you will hopefully get to experience in a lab are the enzymes. These are chemical proteins. Most proteins are enzymatic. When your body is manufacturing protein, um, about 20% of that protein is what we call structural. That's what you can see. So that would be the tissue that you can actually view when you're looking at somebody. It could be um, hair, skin, eye color, and all that. It's, it's pretty much structural protein in nature because you see it. What you don't see is the enzymes. These are the chemical proteins. Um, enzymes are just chemicals that can speed up a chemical reaction without causing an increase in use of energy. They're referred to a lot of times of, as, catal um, as catalysts, which are chemicals that reduce the amount of energy necessary, such as heat, for a chemical reaction to occur. So some specific enzymes you'll see here would be like amylase. This is the enzyme that allows our body to metabolize sugars. Proteases, break down proteins. Lipases, break down lipids. Catalase, which can break down hydrogen peroxide. And I think you'll notice here that we have a common thing about the enzymes is the fact that they all end in the ASE. Enzyme names uh, will always have that ASE ending. And the way an enzyme works is that an enzyme here will bond to some kind of a substrate. It could be a sugar, it could be a protein, it could be a fat. And what that allows the substrate then to do is, is either break apart or bind together. But it allows it to happen in a um, lower body temperature. Because normally if we were to break down um, glucose, we would require heat more so than the body could tolerate, which human bodies are about 98.6. So an enzyme lowers that amount of heat necessary to probably about 98.6, which is human body temperature, for it to, to work. Other things that enzymes, and you can see here, again, it's kind of a lock and key. They're referred to as a lock and key process, that the enzyme fits the substrate so, and then allows a chemical reaction to occur, such as if it's if complex sugar, such as sucrose, which is the sweet sugar you like in candy, and we need to break it down into its components, which is probably glucose and fructose. Um, so there's two um, ways that enzymes can work. One is referred to as a lock and key model, where it fits to the substrate perfectly, or we call it another type, which we call the induced fit model, which the enzyme will simply change the shape slightly 
to accommodate the substrate. Both follow the same principle. Enzymes lower the amount of energy necessary for chemical reactions to occur. Generally, energy comes in the